What's up, everybody? I'm the Hook. And I'm the Blade. And together we're, you know. (laughs) Welcome to the Hook Blade podcast, a show about all things. U.S. politics. Assassins. Creed. (laughs) I'm your host, Lawson, and I'm joined as usual by your host, Tim Burton. Hello. It's been a while, dude. It's been a minute. It's been a couple minutes. The standard treatment hook blade. I literally, I was pulling my mic out from its corner on my desk, and it literally had dust on it. (laughs) I literally dusted off the old microphone to get going on the hooky blade again. Let me just dust off the old microphone real quick. (laughs) What what have you been up to on this long uh, break from podcasting? (sighs) What kind of valuable... And educational exploits have you filled your time with? Well, the holidays happened, and that's always a clusterfuck. It's always a good time, especially or a bad time, especially yeah, especially around this time of, of uh, especially around this time of our existence as as people. Yeah. Let's see what interesting things have I been have I even done at all? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think because I know I have some anecdotes I'd like to share. <laughs> Do you? Fuck. I'm going to pass it to you, and if anything pops in my head, <laughs> then I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll say it. <laughs> yeah, we'll come back to you. You can just interrupt me mid, mid-anecdote. mid <laughs> I don't know. I've been chilling. I got a VR headset that's been pretty fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, playing poker in VR a lot to replace the empty void of social interaction that uh, currently is my life. I'm starting classes next this Monday, and I'm also an intern at a Hollywood studio now. And that's fun. That's right. And I got a job. So (laughs) busy days. Oh, and I found out yesterday I probably have COVID. So that's fun. Yeah. Which is. It was just a matter of time, really. But but (laughs) everyone uh, keep me in your thoughts and prayers. Yeah. Everyone do that. (laughs) I've been meaning to ask you a question. So please do. And this is going to sound. This might sound like ridiculous to ask. Right, but okay. Okay. So that like TVs, monitors, screens in general, right? Like you were telling me yeah. about how our Samsung has like an OLED screen, apparently. Oh, our phones. Our phones, yeah. Like we have the same phone. Yeah. So they both we have, have an the OLED S10 screen. Plus. It has a beautiful OLED screen. Right. Okay. So my question. <laughs> so I keep thinking, like you know, as we're getting into like 4K televisions are pretty prominent right now in people's homes. Uh, I guess 8K eventually will be a thing. And, and like, I know that like QLEDs and whatnot, like they're supposed to like give you a bigger uh, spectrum of color and whatnot to pull from. Yeah. At what point are we just going to exceed what our eyeballs are able to process? Is that ever going to happen? I mean, debatably, we already have. I don't believe anybody who tells me they can look at an 8K monitor side by side with a 4K monitor and tell me they see a difference. Now, I know everyone says that every time there's a jump that like, we how am I supposed to tell the difference between 1080p <laughs> and 720p? So maybe I'm just talking out of my ass here. Maybe I'm just blowing this right out my ass cheeks. But <laughs> I, I really feel like, I really feel like I could never imagine what 8K looks like having any difference or impact on on my enjoyment of visual content. I just I just can't picture it. I it, I've seen plenty of 8K. I, I up until the pandemic, I worked at Best Buy and I had to walk past a a wall of 8K monitors every time I went to piss. Mm. So I've seen it. Okay, <laughs> I know what it looks like. And could I tell you side by side, <laughs> blindly, which one is is 8K and which one's 4K? No. No, <laughs> not a chance. And that's why I think like things like OLED and micro LED in the future, that's going to be more important because you can actually tell the difference. Right. With those technologies, they make a difference to have an OLED. Um, high refresh rate also will be a big deal depending on certain applications. But I, do I think there's going to be a big like, do I think anyone's really pushing to have 8K content and presentation? I I, I hope not. Seems like such a waste of data and size and space and everything. It just seems like a waste of time. Yeah, I, I, I guess I just because like for instance, right, like filming things in black and white is a way that like 
like it's not natural. We don't see in black and white. So there are there are maybe some things that are going to appear on a camera that's filming in black and white that we wouldn't see normally. I mean, you, you kind of get that with like when you put things under like a black light, you know, and you can see semen. So, <laughs> OK, like. I, I whatever. Let's just keep going. Let's move on. <laughs> I don't think I know where you're going with that, but uh... <laughs> speaking of semen, um, so <laughs> Assassin's Creed Four Black Flag, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. <laughs> um, so a couple notes at the top of the show. By the way, guys, uh, we have, as you might have noticed, uh, a new design, new aesthetic. Uh, for no real reason other than that, it gives me something to do, and I like to do it. Well, it's also a new year. It's a new. It's, and it's, it's a, a new, new year. Blade. It's a new era of Hookblade. A new season of Hookblade. Just sort of moving away from the like Northern Lights motif that was very Valhalla centric, but kind of keeping that mint green because it is a. It's a foxy color. <laughs> it's really sexy, <laughs> and you know, it just sort of respects our roots. You know what I mean? It's just sort of how we stay in touch with our roots. But also, alongside this new design, we do have a new upload schedule uh, because of my aforementioned clusterfuck of a life that includes <laughs> classes, interning, and working. And COVID. All from the comfort of my bedroom. We're going to try this. We're going to go a little bi-weekly. We're going to be a little less frequent just every two weeks, just for the the near future. And we're going to see how well that works for us. And we'll just we'll see how that goes. And we're only uploading now, instead of on Thursdays, we're uploading on Tuesdays. Don't ask why, because it doesn't matter and it's not interesting. It's really easy to remember. Every two weeks on Tuesday. Mm. Just get that in your brain. Uh, it, it, is, it is two Tuesdays a month. <laughs> two of the Tuesdays every month. Yeah. Two out of four every Tuesdays. two weeks on a Tuesday. It's the number two. There are two twos in the year 2021. <laughs> there are also two twos in 2020. Shh, shut the fuck up, <laughs> Tim. Do you know why what we're what, what we're here to talk about this week? Um, I, odds and ends. <laughs> odds and ends. What are odds and ends? Um, well, they're they're just little things that kind of get get. They just you uh, know what's, miscellaneous what's items. The, what's the metaphor I'm going for here? The, uh, fuck. Um. Help me out. Come on. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But look, odds and ends, okay? Everyone knows what odds and ends are. I don't need to explain it to you. They're just, we're going to talk about some Assassin's Creed news and developments that that has sort of come and gone without us really addressing them. Uh, so that's everything from like the VR game idea to like the Yule Festival, some patches, some controversial changes that they've made <laughs> all adding to the general feeling. And I'm, I'm sure you're going to agree with me on this, Tim. It really seems like since we stopped paying attention to Valhalla and stopped playing it, it's just sort of kept getting shittier. Yeah. I mean, keep in mind, I haven't touched it since we talked about it in depth on, on the show. I haven't even, I think I booted it up once after that, but it's, it's, it's been probably like what a couple months now. Yeah, I haven't touched me it. Me neither, really. I played around with it on when I got my PS5 to see if it was much better. And I mean, six, uh, 60 FPS makes everything better, but it's still Valhalla at the end of the day, unfortunately. And that means it's still not that great. So like the Yule Festival thing was really interesting. And by really interesting, I mean really boring. <laughs> um, but what was interesting about it was how it fucked the game in half in so many different and interesting ways. Like, uh, you know, um, people talked about pretty much universally they would load in drunk anytime they fast travel that happened to me in in the base game but was it during the yule festival that it happened to you or no 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 it was it was way before when when i was doing my original playthrough oh. of it whenever i would load up i would be shit face drunk and i would have to run around and fight people just to have it wear off yeah, or you'd have to like talk to an NPC or something. Well, it no, it wouldn't go away even then. So what I'm thinking is that the the people who are reporting it happening in the Yule Festival, something that same glitch was just perpetuated among like everyone for some reason. Yeah. I also heard people would load in completely blind with a black screen and that would only fix by talking to somebody. So you had to navigate <laughs> yourself from pure memory from where you load in on the on the uh, settlement to go talk to like Gunner or something. Just to have your vision restored. That's that's or like pretty echo great. location. That's pretty fabulous. It was all these things that made me not want to do it. And also the fact that like, what do I like? It's okay. So it's snowing and there are some activities 
like drinking games and shit. I don't even know. I I just I could never I could never care about this. I'm sorry. I mean, I like the idea of like having sort of an update in content of like, uh, hey, here's here's a, a new thing you get because it's holidays and because we're a live service, we can just do a holiday thing that only yeah. lasts. But you know, I also it's also part of the experience that's like it's time sensitive. And it's like, what am I going to get for for doing all these activities? Well, apparently some tokens of some sort that'll let me buy some gear that I'm not going to use because I don't play the game anymore because there's nothing to do. Yeah, I found all the things like what are people who keep playing the game actually doing? Is it just are you doing all of the like red uh, radiant missions? Is that the idea is okay. So is the idea that the Yule Festival is only accessible if you've beaten the game? Because I could see people who are taking their, their time with it and haven't beaten yet, which is a possibility that they're just that like the Yule Festival could be more advantageous to do then because you'd have stuff to take in with you for the rest of your playthrough. Maybe, but it's it is available to people who haven't finished the game. Right. It was available to everybody. So maybe that's, you know, I don't know. It's just it's it's Yule Festival. Tell us in the comments. Did you like the Yule Festival? Was that something you actually enjoyed doing? If so, Why? Because I just could not yeah. be arsed. To, to give clarification and see if anyone else had the same issue with the drunking thing, w- 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 with being drunk, I when I first went to Jotunheim, I, I did the quest where I got blackout drunk with the Jotun, with, with, with those damn Jotner. And, those Jotner. Uh, every, time, uh. every time, even after finishing the quest, every time I would load up a Jotunheim, like if I would leave the game and come back into Jotunheim, I'd be shit faced. And so. Yeah. I think it was the fault of the Yatner, the the damn Yatner. Well, I mean, we can we just Everything's we can blame fault. them for all of our problems and not hold the right people accountable. I think so too. I love that idea personally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that takes care of the Yule Festival. Though um, there is a more hilarious change that recently came in a patch. Have you have you heard of this? Do you know what I'm the, talking the about? The last thing I heard of is that bosses were level scaled with you. Yeah, that did happen. If that's not this. That I don't know. I can't really get a grasp on the significance of that, mostly because I haven't kept playing, but I do know a lot of people who are really upset about the way that they changed level scaling because it made it so... Like, I know one person was talking about how they try to keep their character under-leveled, and what they would essentially run into, I, I think this person was... I think this was Obese Ninja 07, one of the one of the mods. It might have been them, or, or Kasax. I don't remember. Someone... <laughs> If it was you, tell me in the comments who was telling me about this. <laughs> uh, but they would keep, they would try to keep under leveled. I think it was Obese Ninja. They would try to keep under leveled so that the game would actually be interesting, challenging, difficult in any way. But then what happened after the update was the bosses wouldn't scale the same way as the enemies in the world did. So if you kept yourself under leveled so that the world enemies would challenge you, then the bosses would just spank you. You had no hope in hell of right. ever managing the boss. So then you'd have to go back into your menu, level yourself up by tediously allocating all those hundreds of skill points that you have avoided spending. Then you can fight the boss, and then every enemy in the area is piss easy, and you just you cut them with your sword like a droid in the prequel movies. Mm-hmm. Like It's just <laughs> it's that drastic. That sounds like a nightmare. I don't like that. It seems like the whole level scaling thing uh, would worse impact people who were still playing the game as opposed to people who have beaten it. Definitely, I think so. Yeah, uh, which is part of why no one will be finished with this game until fucking March. Yeah, pretty much. Whatever. Yeah. So there was a post on the subreddit from Dom VGT, who's kind of like the the patch notes guy. He's always talking about patch notes on Twitter and Reddit. Uh, he says, you know, hey everyone, we we want to take a moment to provide you with some information about a recent community discussion revolving around the replacement of diamond rune slots. So, Tim, you know how on your gear you'll have circle rune slots that are just like piss baby runes, (laughs) and then you'll have diamond runes that are like big boy runes that actually make a difference? Mm -hmm. Apparently, in the most recent update, they just got rid of a lot of those diamond rune slots on gear. Nice. Crucially, on mostly the gear that people paid for in the store. Oh, boy. They said, our development team has recently discovered that a few gear set items had diamond rune slots by mistake. I'm sorry. How does that happen by mistake? (laughs) How do you recently discover that? That can't be the case, right? They had to just decide for some other reason 
to get rid of those, I would think. And then they've said that in an upcoming title update, they're going to replace the diamond rune slots in the, the Niflheim gear set, the Gothic gear set, the Hell's Damnation gear set. Now, I'm not... I'm not in tune enough with the game to really understand exactly the extent of this change. Like, it seems like maybe it's only affecting certain items within those gear sets. I guess maybe the idea is that one item is supposed to have a diamond rune and the rest are not supposed to have those diamond runes. But a lot of people bought those gear sets because of the fucking diamond rune slots. And they spent like full on $20 on gear only to have it be just ripped away from them afterwards. And it seems like there's no plan for them to like refund any of those people or even give them back their Helix credits. It seems like a really weird thing to do. I gotta say, I really, I, I, I really have an issue with, I remember I sent you this tweet and it's like, it was from like Ubisoft and they were like, all right, well we have a, we have, we have a list here of all known issues. And it's like the fact that there's yeah. even a list of all known issues is a problem. I feel like, I think most games, at least in the modern era of relying on patches and changes, I think it's a common practice, but the list is pretty long for what well, it is. Well, it's not, yeah, but know? yeah, but it's just like, generally speaking, like, it's not, it's not just Ubisoft that does this, obviously, but like, no, I just yeah. hate, I hate, hate, hate how so many issues can, can just fall through the cracks and affect players like you and where people have to fucking like replay the first three arcs over and over and over again because of these issues. And yeah. they're like, well, fuck it. We'll just fix it in a patch. And if we don't fix it in that one, we'll put out another one. And it's like, I just wish games could come out released, finished. And not be fundamentally broken on so many levels. It's like, I, I and I get it. Like, like uh, you know, bugs and glitches, like that's always going to be a thing. There's always going to be some, some, some uh, oversight and, Sure, like, and that's where patches can come in, re in really in handy. But this is another fucking level. Like, there are so <laughs> many issues that, like, I, I don't think I've seen a single person in our Twitter sphere that hasn't had one, like, very hindering issue with the game experience. Yeah. Um, and in some cases, I'd say, like, <laughs> I'd say, like, one out of every three people have had a game-breaking bug. Yeah. It's fucked. <laughs> <laughs> it's also really interesting when I think about, when I compare this experience to what Unity was like at launch. And Unity was pretty broken at launch too, but the majority of Unity's bugs seem to be like visual cosmetic bugs, like people fucking losing their faces and shit and popping all over the place. And it got this huge reputation of everyone talking about how disappointing and frustrating that game was, almost largely because of how buggy it was. And now this game has not really had that experience. I, and I'm trying to figure out, is it because they weren't as easily memeable bugs? Like we couldn't put a Reddit post with a screenshot of this bug. Yeah. So it didn't go viral. Mm -hmm. Is it because genuinely uh, fewer people are experiencing those bugs? I, I doubt that very much from experience. I think it's, I think it's a mixture of what you're saying as as it's not very memeable a lot of these things are just very frustrating but not screenshot worthy i also think the right. game's length because you could you know let's say you play the game for like 30 something hours and then you're writing an article about it you may have not seen all of the shit that you could see yet because mm. i mean just doing the essentials it took me like 80 to 80 90 hours or so you know so the game bought the game got increasingly more broken as it went on too because they prioritize fixing the bugs that more people are likely to right. encounter so i i feel like it's a mixture of that the glitches that people do come across it's not like they can make a really like that Unity screenshot with with the faceless Charles Dorian, you know, that was everywhere. That yeah. is funny as in and of itself because that only affected a handful of graphics cards. Like 98% yeah. of people who played the game didn't even ever see that glitch. And Cyberpunk 2 has a lot more visible, memeable glitches. For sure, for sure. And accepting like the 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 last gen console experience, which was clearly super fucked for everybody. Like, I almost did feel in general like Valhalla was more broken than Cyberpunk was. And I also have to throw in that, like, I was playing Valhalla a week earlier than it launched, so that was part of the problem, too. Like, I was running into... When I when I had my game-breaking bug, I believe I was the first person to post about it on the forum, and then by the next couple of weeks, 
there were hundreds of posts. It was on the known issues list. And that, that certainly is, is part of the experience right. as well. But yeah, all in all, I feel like Valhalla is almost, it deserves more hate. <laughs> and, and not even when it comes to like faceless character models or whatever. I just, I mean, every once every hour, probably I would crash and I, and I had to reload it. I mean, that's just yeah. not fun. Yeah. Not fun. Not cool. Not very cash money at all. Not at all. But you know what's going to be great and not have any problems? Uh, AC VR. Assassin's Creed on VR. I'm actually able to weigh in on this with some uh, experience because I've been playing uh, VR games recently. I've been trying out a bunch of them. Some of them are great. You know, I, I love Super Hot. I love Beat Saber. It is fun to play poker with a bunch of randos. But I have noticed something about VR, which is that uh, one of the strengths of VR... Let me phrase this differently. One of the weaknesses of VR <laughs> is any game that requires you to be moving. Right. Like, most games that you're playing in VR, the idea is that you're teleporting from place to place because if you actually smoothly ambulated between these places, if you smoothly walked between those points, you would get hella motion sick because from your eyes and your brain, you are moving, but your body is not experiencing motion. Obviously, that's weird, right? Unless you're one of those random, like, rich assholes who has a VR fucking... Treadmill. What are they? Uh, uh, the treadmills, the 360 treadmills. I know they make shoes now that are supposed to do that. I Jeez. don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how they're, they're, they plan on simulating what you can do in, like, the regular games in terms of parkour it, it, in VR. I, I'm I'm really skeptical of that. Uh uh, Splitter Cell almost seems like the easier one to tackle out of those two because Hitman is already doing their VR, and I'm yeah. sure that there's a lot of crossover in terms of what they would do in a stealth game on VR that Hitman's already doing. Like maybe, maybe like maybe it could work. Just maybe. I mean, I can imagine teleporting around a little Tuscan countryside and stabbing people behind their sure. backs if Hitman's doing it. I guess Assassin's Creed could do it. I do want to. Say though that I I I wanna I wanna put out like what I what I think is most likely in terms of map. I think I think what's most likely to me is that it's going to be like a highlight reel of all of the most famous AC locations. So it will have like Venice and maybe even like Boston. I could see that maybe being different in a VR setting. Uh, definitely. A lot of the Etsy locations, maybe some Black Flag stuff, but either way, I just think that it's going to be like a, like you're going to be jumping through these different time periods and, and different, and through these different maps. I don't know if they're going to make like an original story or an original map for the VR. I don't think, I don't know if that's super likely. I think that's what they're going to do. I think it's, I, I think that's what makes most sense to me, but also I want to, uh, I want to, I want to wager a guess at what the poster is going to look like for it. Or, or rather, like, the cover for it. Do you think they're going to put an assassin like Ezio in a VR helmet? No. <laughs> Close. I think it's going to be, like, some random schmuck like you or me in, like, a Brahmin headset with the Abstergo symbol on it. And then it's going to, like, shooting uh -huh. out from around him is going to be, like, Italy and Boston and all that. And that's going to be the game. And we're all going to love it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the problem with that idea is it would require a lot of different assets. Yeah, yeah And if but they're just I mean, porting them in from the old games, if they're just porting them in, there's no guarantee they'll work with whatever the movement system is that they come up with for this game. So I'm, I'm not saying it's going to be the entire map of Venice, but it, it certainly, I it, know. it could be a significant different chunk. arenas. If they do little like, like squared away gameplay segments, that's totally possible. Also, are these going to be for the quest too? Because there's, only so much you can do with games on the quest. It's a, it's kind of not a super powerful platform because it's probably got less than a, you know, your average mobile phone, pretty much hardware in, inside there. I don't really know. I don't know how it's going to work, but you know what? I like VR. VR is cool. I like Assassin's Creed, uh, sometimes. So <laughs> sometimes. maybe I'll like Assassin's Creed on VR. Let me ask you this, Lawson. Do you actually yeah. like when and at any point when you're playing AC, have you ever said to yourself like this would be pretty cool in VR? Imagining that VR is as best as it could be, do you do you think that the AC experience could be better in VR? Not better, but good. That's the thing. And and here is where it gets interesting for me, is because that phrase you used, the AC experience, unfortunately, is not a phrase that means anything <laughs> anymore because 
There is no such thing as an AC experience. That's fair. Because the experience you'll have in Valhalla is fundamentally diametrically yeah. different than what you would have out of the AC experience of 2009 or 2014 That's a good point. That's or a good point. year. And so, like, as a really obvious example of that, you mentioned parkour. And yes, that is a, a curious idea of how do you do parkour in VR. I think it could work because a couple of the games I've played involve you climbing things and you kind of just have to move your hands to different sure. handholds and pull yourself up, which is immersive and cool and exciting. And you actually get that sensation when you're really high up of like, oh, fuck, I'm really high right. up. In fact, if you climbed like a viewpoint in AC VR, you would be like shitting yourself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be like, holy Christ, I'm really That's high a good up. Point. If I slip, I could fall and die. That sounds amazing. But if you look at the most recent AC games, parkour doesn't really matter that much. Well, so maybe I'm just riding a horse in VR. That's the thing, Lawson, is is it goes back to our discussion about the Netflix show. Yeah. This VR experience has to tap into even the most like casual Assassin's Creed players knowledge of Assassin's Creed. And so it, it's gonna have to it's gonna have to be like you could climb up this viewpoint and it, like they're going to have to to focus on parkour a little because yeah your average joe that goes and walks into GameStop to buy this is going to want to run around on rooftops and stab people they're not going to want to ride a horse and you know you still have viewpoints and shit so you're going to have those in VR theoretically but I also think about, you know, there was a game that came out on mobile a while ago called Assassin's Creed Identity. Did you ever play I, that? I know I know what it is. I've never played it, but I know I'm not, it, it takes place in Rome. The idea of it is it's like, well, let's how do we turn your actual experience of playing Assassin's Creed game into a mobile game? And it is kind of it is. I mean, that is what they do. But it really just means you have a very small map. You can do very basic parkour in. And you can do very basic button presses yeah. to, you know, do assassinations and stuff. It's not very open worldy, which I guess the VR game probably wouldn't be either. It would probably just be like, yeah, we drop you in a tiny map. You have a linear mission. There's one guy you got to kill at the end of it. And you run around, you do assassin things, and you kill them. And then you play the next level. That's probably what this is going to be. Probably the same for Splinter Cell. I'd imagine if they're both being co-developed at the same time by the same studios, there might be some interesting similarities in terms of design philosophy between the two. And I don't know shit about Splinter Cell, so I can't weigh in on, on what that would look like for either game. I know a little. I mean, I, I, I've, I've played, a, I've played a, a couple of them. Um, I think they, they're going to have an e they're gonna have such an easier time with Splinter Cell just because Splinter, Cell's, Splinter Cell uh, and stealth games in general in terms of stealth games that are as stealthy as Splinter Cell, they kind of promise the idea of being patient, moving slowly, waiting for guard paths, and being and just overall being incredibly yeah. patient and waiting for the right time to move. And I think V and I think that really helps them with VR because the less you are, the the slower the pace. I imagine the the easier it'll it'll feel right. Like yeah. So definitely. and in terms of like Splinter Cell does have a lot of like you're climbing up on the rafters and you're. And you're kind of like climbing on pipes on the ceiling and whatnot. And that's very easily simulated through VR. So I'll, they're going to have a really easy time with, with with Splinter Cell, I think, compared to Assassin's Creed. I think in terms of the Assassin's Creed VR experience, as, so long as they give you a, a hidden blade and they can let you like kind of scale buildings in that way that you were describing. And like just air assassinating a guy in VR would probably be kind of cool. That would be pretty weird. They got to be careful with how they do this because, I mean, there's like a game on the fucking VR store that I looked at. It was called like Richie's Plank Experience or something. And it really is just a game that puts you at the top of a tower and you have to walk out on a little plank and be scared shitless by it. And they charge $15 for that. <laughs> and... There are all these warnings and things that they ask you to do. They're like, you should have two spotters when you play this game standing around you in case you fall. That's something that they actually have to tell you to do. And I can't speak from experience as to whether that's necessary because I'm not paying $15 to step out on a plank. But it makes me wonder, like, in terms of the motion experience and the comfort level of it, how crazy can they really go? How, how well can they do the viewpoints how well could they do an air assassination without genuinely risking making people sick when they play it is the question. 
And the answer is like, do they just not do those things? Do they just put you inside and just change the entire perspective of the game? Or do they have you controlling somebody in a weird third person way that VR games sometimes do uh, and, and do it that way? That could be kind of interesting. I bet I would have a lot less motion sickness if I was playing an Assassin's Creed game in VR that was still third person and I was just watching. You know, that's around. not that that's not a bad point. I I, I think that, that that could kind of even kind of simulate the whole uh, Assassin's Creed identity thing you were talking about. Right. And then it's it's just about putting yourself in the world and having the, the sort of immersive experience. Right. And maybe it, it maybe it shifts you into first person at strategic yeah. moments. So you get that. Oh, shit factor of climbing a viewpoint. I do think the first person aspect of it might it, it might be the selling point when it comes to viewpoints and like maybe a leap of faith or whatever. But you're you're right in that there yeah. is the risk of making people sick and, and whatnot. So I don't know. I, I but like I feel like doing a leap of faith in VR not in first person would suck. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So you know we've talked about VR. We talked about these patch notes. Uh, I wanted. To, I've, been, I've been wanting to ask you, Tim. I've been thinking. I've been wanting to ask you. Can I ask you a question? Are you asking me to prom? How'd you know? <laughs> How do you feel about Assassin's Creed in general, as a brand, as a product, as a as a thing, as a fandom community, a thing you're a part of? Like, wh- let let me take your pulse. Where where does your heart beat at with with Assassin's Creed? It's not looking good. Um, <laughs> I might, I might have, I'm, I might fall into cardiac arrest here soon. <laughs> yeah, you know, look, like when Odyssey was coming out, and I was very absent from the whole hype cycle of that, and I wasn't active on tw- AC Twitter very much during that time, and or the subreddit. That yeah. was kind of where I fell off of the subreddit um, for a while. I just kind of felt like, oh, you know, it's it's just going through a phase. You know, it's just acting yeah. out. It's it's being impulsive and sometimes it's being rebellious. Sometimes you have to let the teenager go to the party and get drunk, you know, and just make sure that he doesn't drive home drunk. Uh, yeah. I feel like right now, though, they're getting behind the wheel and they're starting and they're not calling us for a ride home. They're not uh, setting up a designated driver. They're just fucking getting in the car and they're hitting the gas, you know, and if they hit a mailbox, they hit a mailbox. And uh, I I feel like the mailbox at the moment. Um, <laughs> And I'm not. Yeah, but I mean, worst case scenario, they just fly off the side of a bridge and they go into the water, and well, you never see or hear from them again. I, I, that's the, that's the like, that's the most likely progression of this, right? Is like I think Assassin's Creed yeah. is gonna fucking just bury itself uh, if it keeps going this route because they're gonna alienate everyone that made the game successful. I feel like yeah. to a certain degree, uh, obviously, like. We, me and you and 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 like to rule, we're not the ones that are making AC sell very well, obviously. But what I mean is, yeah. eventually, Assassin's Creed isn't going to mean anything. As you said earlier, the AC experience doesn't mean anything anymore. Uh, yeah. And so it's yeah. like being a fan of Assassin's Creed. Like, what does that what, what does that mean exactly? What are you a fan of? What am I a fan of? Am I a fan <laughs> of kind of historical accuracy? You know, like <laughs> like what am I a fan of right now? And if you had asked me. When I went to the Revelations Midnight release when I was 11 years old, why I'm an Assassin's Creed fan, I could give you 10 reasons. Now I could yeah. maybe give you one or two. I'm not happy with it. I, I, I feel, uh, and I, obviously that's kind of the, the motif of this podcast, right? It's not being happy with Assassin's Creed, but. And, and this is good, I think, to refresh ourselves on in this episode, our first episode of 2021, because we're going to have an idea by the end of the year where it's going is it is it going is it getting on the bridge and and getting really shaky and and we're and suspenseful and like oh god this could be it or is it like hey they they pulled over and they called us and they said (laughs) mom i'm not okay and now we maybe have a chance right and we're not mad we're just disappointed we're getting the minivan we can drive to where they are right you know maybe call a tow truck or something or, or find a way to par- find a place to park on we drive them home and they can tell us in the car they can be like mom i, I really fucked up and he'd be like hey it's okay son you have to learn from your mistakes assassin's creed in this case is a teenage son because boys are stupider than girls are and because they never advertise women right. in the franchise. The the uh, sister is at home studying. Yeah, the, the AC sisterhood is at home being a very good <laughs> child. 
They're not doing anything wrong, and we love them. We mwah, we love them. Right. But uh, as far as Assassin's Creed goes, that rascal. Listen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And I, I struggle with this because, like, I'm I'm an like I'm an eternal optimist. I don't know if you know that about me, but I'm a very optimistic person in life in general. I'm not. We're not going to get too deep into this because we actually have a real fun, epic time planned for our next episode. Uh, we're having on as a guest, uh, Mr. Nstav13, who is a working game developer person, and uh, and he has some insights, some some thoughts to share on the recent spate of leaks and you know i say quote unquote leaks because they're not they're not really leaks are they tim they're pretty much um what's another good word lies they're lies that people are telling <laughs> that are not based in fact or reality they're not leaks what's another good word i uh, bullshit <laughs> Someone do yeah, an, someone did an MS Paint map of India, uh, and we're going to talk about it next next episode. To pre- yeah, to pre- I guess to preface our positions on it, yeah, we I, they're kind of BS, but we'll you know we'll talk about them, I guess. And <laughs> and the most exciting or the one that everyone's picking up is this idea that in 2022, uh, like maybe quarter one of 2022, we're going to get a smaller game that is and i'm kind of i'm fusing a couple of different rumors together because they're pretty compatible but this idea that the next one will be set in like medieval france and germany like medieval europe basically in general and that it's going to be uh a th- they they've said a fantasy take on assassin's creed and as if that hasn't already been a thing uh, as if as if they haven't been fantasy games since 2017 right <laughs> no but but just in that, just think about this with me for a second. Let's just play this out hypothetically. Hypothetically, for the sake of argument. <laughs> so let's say hypothetically, for the sake of the argument. Okay, folks. <laughs> um, we have these last three games. They exist. That we know what they are. They're very mythologically influenced. They have these mystical elements to them. Some are more grounded than others. And at no point in these three games has Ubisoft called them fantasy games. So the question becomes, if this game, this new one that they're definitely making and isn't a complete bullshit leak, if they're willing to call that a fantasy game, what does that mean for what the game actually is? Yeah. And and here's here's the confusion for me is I felt I thought like Phoenix, whatever, Gar- Immortals Rising, like I thought that was kind of their <laughs> way to take the elements of Odyssey that they, that they really wanted to explore more and expand on and then make it its yeah. own IP so that they didn't piss off more people. We also know that at one point Ubisoft canceled like a full on Arthurian legend fantasy game too. Like it was called Avalon. People were really excited about it. And then the higher ups at Ubisoft were like, mm, what if instead we didn't do that? <laughs> it's like, it's like they all want to do these things and they have to like prove themselves by doing it in an established brand first. So they all have to like muck about in the, they have to piss in the pool of Assassin's Creed in order to get approval. Yeah. Make their it, own thing that they want to do. It, it, it does seem as if though we got about like three different potential games that people are talking about. Right. Like, yeah. We have the medieval France, Germany, fantasy garbage. We have the India and some parts of Pakistan, right? I don't fucking know. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and then what's the third one? I'm missing the third one. Uh, China or Japan. That's Just- right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we got, yeah, we have China potential. No, wait, wasn't there one that we read that was Japan? Uh, yeah, that, that leak. And I, <laughs> I still don't know if that's been. Yeah. Leak. Yeah. I keep, I keep saying leak. I mean, rumor or lie, uh, <laughs> that lie. I don't know if it got reposted. It, it was like intercepted by our auto moderator and it may never have gotten past it. Right. People may not have seen that one probably for the best. Cause it is, it's, it's like real fan fiction type shit for sure. But out of all of these three proposed ideas, that is the one that I hope is true. So if we get into that next episode, that could be fun. Yeah, and Noah, uh, he's he he's such a handsome lad. Uh, it's gonna be fun to what have. What a great him guy! On. We don't want to blow our load for that episode. <laughs> I can't believe he got. I, I I can't believe he finally settled down, man. I mean, ugh, he's off the market for you, Tim. I know. No I'm chance. really pissed about that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here's something. Remember when I tweeted you, not tweeted you, when I sent you the tweet about the Shaojun manga? I, I thought yes. that already happened. Am, am I losing my mind? Didn't the Shaojun um, manga already happen? It 
did, but it was in another language. But do you think this? Do you think this is just a translation or is it a new story? Uh, I gotta look at it again. Let me uh, let, let me, me see, see if, if I, I can find, find it. it again. I mean, look, I'm never gonna read a manga, so sorry. But, Ubisoft uh, and Viz Media partner up for an Assassin's Creed manga. Yeah, three days ago from Eurogamer. Blade of Shao Jun. Man, this is different. Oh wait, no, it's not. It's not different from the one that was already out. <sighs> it doesn't look like it to me. Shit. This is one that's coming that will be available in English. I'm seeing in November of 2020, it says Assassin's Creed Blade of Shao Jun manga coming in 2021. So uh, it's possible that I was thinking about the announcement of it, but I, I thought there was already a Shao Jun manga that came out like years ago. No, you know what? There was a Chinese comic that came out that was not about Shao Jun, and that's probably what you're thinking of. It was called Assassin's Creed Dynasty. It was not, to my knowledge, ever released in English. And it was created in China, written by Chinese uh, authors, published in China. Was never It never came to the U.S. Or, or France or the U.K. or anything, right? So that might be what you're thinking of. Because I think Shao Jun appears as a character in that, but it's not about Shao Jun. If that's not what you're thinking of, then you are just probably thinking of an earlier announcement for the Shao Jun. Right. Manga. Yeah, I think I think it's I think it could be a combination of, of the two. I, I think I uh I, I, I think I might be thinking of the comic. And I'm torn on this because like I love I, I mean Shao Jun is is cool. Shao Jun is some would say Shao Jun is my queen. Uh yeah, yeah. Don't say you love Shao Jun. I mean, what is there mm. to fucking love about the character anyway? Sorry, go on. Well well what you have to understand, Tim, is that Shao Jun is my queen. And that's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I that's what I say all the time, and I've never heard anyone else say that. Right. Um, just kidding. Aren't you writing? Aren't you writing a trilogy of novels about Shao Jun? Yeah, I, people know that I'm writing a trilogy of <laughs> fan novels called The Blade in the Shadows. That's a thing that I'm doing. Uh, that you might be familiar. <laughs> <laughs> you might have seen on Twitter. You might have seen on Twitter. <laughs> No, we're just, we're, we're having fun. Uh, shout outs to Sarib underscore Beg. I think that's how it's pronounced. It probably isn't. Uh, he's writing a trilogy of Shao Jun fan fictions. And uh, I can't wait. The first one is coming out soon. It's coming out soon. May, may even be out by the time we push, put out this episode. I don't know. If it I, is, I'm not sure if the manga is going to interrupt some of that. Maybe we'll see. Yeah, it might. I mean, I've uh, I've definitely had to cancel a fan fiction project due to a different transmedia thing coming out that would have stepped on it. Yeah, I've done that. I know. I know, I heard, I know about that one. Yeah, me and me and Blue from Overly Sarcastic Productions <laughs> had a really cool idea that we were gonna write about, and then they made a, a Last Descendants novel, and we said, "Why don't we just not do this anymore?" Look, I. Here's how I feel about Shao Jun. Let's just talk about Shao Jun real quick. Do I have a little chat about Shao Jun? I, I, yeah, that's, yeah, sure. All right, listen. Shao Jun, cool character design. Embers is great. There was definitely a time in which, had they announced like a Shao Jun full on Chinese set Assassin's Creed game, that would have been great. Now, if they were to announce that next year or something, I would have the same reaction to it as like the Black Widow movie at Marvel. It'd be like, cool. But too late. You should have done this five years ago. Now I just don't care that much. And with every like transmedia announcement they make, uh, that they're doing more stuff with Shao Jun in these comics and manga and chronicles and what have you, that feels to me like pretty solid indication. Not only that they're never getting a Shao Jun game, but also that we probably shouldn't have one anyway. Because I would at this point I would rather see a China game with a, like a completely new character. And Shao Jun can be a side character. Shao Jun can maybe be like the the ancestor who leaves collectibles for you to find or codex well, pages or what have you. That that was what I was gonna say too, is I feel like if they do make a China game, it's not gonna be Shao Jun, but Shao Jun is gonna be like like you can collect her sword or some shit, right? Like she's yeah. gonna be a a formidable assassin that everyone talks about and she's like a legend among among the creed there. But you're, she's not going to be present in the game necessarily. Or you know they do a China game before Shao Jun exists, and then you get little like teases of the of the Jun family. You get like Helix Rift style flash forwards because she would be like your descendant, yeah, and you could play that's a little, good idea. little gameplay segments as Shao Jun in in a future 
in a later China than the one you're in in the game. Because they've talked about, I think, ancient China as being a possibility. I don't know. I'd personally rather see Japan than China in a game, maybe. I know everyone thinks that that'll be too Ghost of Tsushima esque, but I still think it'd be cool. I don't know too much about like Chinese history. I don't know like what ancient China looks like compared to like I don't know medieval China. I don't. I mean, I have no idea. But this isn't the podcast for people who care about history. Yeah, go things. over to OSP production sarcastic. Podcast. We'll ask. We'll ask Noah next episode. OSP about history, <laughs> and we'll hear what he says. OSP sarcastic productions. Podcast productions. <laughs> um, overly sarcastic OSP. <laughs> Our overly sarcastic OSP productions podcast. Uh, <laughs> Shao Jun is fine. I liked her and I liked her in Embers. I appreciate the little foot blade thing. Uh, yeah. But beyond that, I don't. I think. I think people f- fell in love with the idea of Shao Jun. They don't know, like they don't love the character. They love the idea. And well, that's the thing. She's just she's a great design. Yeah, for a character. She's, she's a good template, but there's not a character there. It's like Boba Fett. Like we just like thought he looked cool and everyone confused that for thinking he was a good character. It's exactly like Boba Fett. It's exactly like that. Literally, the Eurogamer article just said like fan favorite Shao Jun. It's like there, it's a fan favorite like character design pretty much as you're saying it's not like i mean she is a fan favorite how many people do we know with shao jun avatar i know but okay tell me lawson what is a okay actually no yeah. i'm gonna leave it to the people in the comments uh list off shao jun character traits and if you can't name more than one that is a problem okay yeah that's a fun challenge tell us tell us what defines shao jun as a character beyond her aesthetic <laughs> So, hey, everybody, look, if you enjoyed this episode of the Hook Blade podcast, sh- shout it from the mountaintops. Tell your friends who like Assassin's Creed and podcasts that they need to listen to this one. Leave a comment, leave a like, subscribe to us, hit the bell icon, tweet at us at Hookblade, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. These are the things that really help us out. They go a long way. And so we really appreciate when you do them. I have been the hook. No, fuck. No, that's not right. I've been the blade. I've been the hook. And I've been the blade. And we will see you on our next episode when we are joined by uh, Mr. Nstav13 or or Noah, as we sometimes call him as well. And uh, we will we will have a good time. We will talk about the leaks, the rumors, the lies. I appreciate uh you guys being patient uh, with us putting out this episode. Overall, though, we're we're, we're got to be recording these again, and we've got some yeah. pretty good ideas. We still got to finish off our, our Unity and Syndicate re- replays, and Lawson's gonna try and get me to play Origins, and we'll see what the fuck yeah. happens with that. But and maybe I'll try to get him to play Odyssey. Yeah, you're gonna have to like blow me like six t- days a week. <laughs> Look, nothing's off the table, Tim. <laughs> yeah, I'm but, a man who uh, gets what I want. <laughs> Overall, thank you so much for listening to us. And I would say we'll see you next week. Because that's, that's not typically true. how we end episodes. But we're not going to see you next week. We're going to see you in two weeks on Tuesday. It's very really easy to remember when you say it like that. <laughs> right? It's super helpful. So, uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your couple of weeks. Uh, have a good one. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>